Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our webinar today. Uh, today we're talking about time-saving tips for lesson planning in this brave new world that we're in. Uh, my name is Dawn and I will be going through the webinar with you. I will also be sending out a recording after the webinar. Uh, all the resources, links uh, are found in this hyperdoc. So in the handout section of the webinar, you'll see this as a PDF and all those links there will, will link to the things that I'm gonna be sharing and talking with you. And then uh, we have our behind the scenes uh, guru, Robin, who's there to help with any tech issues or if you have any questions at all, she's there. Hey, Robin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Awesome. So yes, again, thank you so much for taking that time out of your incredibly busy schedules to join us on such an important topic. But before we really dive into things, I'd love to see who is um, joining us today. So what grade level uh, do you teach here? So Robin's going to pull up a poll, and if you could kindly uh, answer that, um, and then we will continue on. And just to let you know that all of these resources, the tips that I'm going to share today uh, for lesson planning is applicable for K-12. So it, it really is open to anybody in any grade level, and there'll be some strategies you'll be able to use uh, right away in your classroom. All right, Robin, what do we have? So it looks like we have a little bit of everything here today, but um, we have the most high school. We have 47% high school. 21% uh, upper elementary and middle school, 14% lower L, and 12% other or admin. Okay, well, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, to let you know, too, that our webinar today is sponsored by Blue Apple Projects. These are project-based learning units that engage students, teach content, all while making the world a better place. Um, these projects include all the plans and supplies you need in any environment, whether in person, virtual or hybrid, the real world connections, the cross curricular content and those collaboration options as well. And because you are viewing the webinar, whether um, live or the recording, you have the opportunity to receive 10% off your next project. Use the code uh, webinar at blueappleteacher.org. So this is one of uh, my favorite gifts right now, and it really sums up this entire year in, in planning and that uh, whiplash of <laughs> um, you know, just transitioning between different learning environments uh, as we uh, started the school year and as we continue to move through uh, this school year. And this quote also resonated with me, um, hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I think for teachers, I wanna change that a little bit, maybe make it a little bit uh, more positive, but we're definitely hoping for the best, but we're planning for the rest. Uh, we just know how uncertain things are right now. And you may be in person right now, but tomorrow you may walk into your classroom and find out half of your students are gone because they're quarantined due to a close contact. And now you have not only students you have to plan for that are in front of you, but also students that are at home learning virtually. So how do you meet the needs of the students without having to create multiple lesson plans for all these different types of situations? And that's what we're really gonna be talking about today. And so to really help um, as we go through, I'd love to find out what your current learning environment is. So Robin's gonna pull up a poll here. Are you um, in person, are you hybrid, or are you remote? Take a, a you know, few seconds to answer that. And Robin, when you see things are coming in, if you wanna go ahead and close that and share those results. All right, so we have 77% that are fully remote. Um, and then 19% hybrid and 4% fully in person. So definitely some big gaps there. Wow, okay, and 4% in person. All right, well, I have a follow-up question to that as well. And how many times have you changed your learning environment this school year? So maybe you started off virtual, then you went to hybrid, then you went um, to in-person, then you're back to virtual. So thinking about that, you know, how many times have you had to transition what you've been doing? So it looks like the most come in around two times. So 29% two times, followed by 25% one time, 24% zero, 
16% at three and only 5% four or more times. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, so then we know that there's definitely been some transitions. Um, many of you have transitioned multiple times or maybe you haven't transitioned yet, but there is a possibility that you might in the future. So today we're really gonna look at um, big ideas. What are five considerations that really help you plan for anything? And then also some practical tips. So some strategies that will make it work for you in your situation, things that you can start doing right away. And for the first big idea, and if 77% of those on the line on the call right now are fu fully virtual, you are already hitting this, this first big idea. That is to plan for remote first. Um, if you're planning for remote first and you do transition um, back to, maybe you're transitioning back into the classroom or you're in the classroom and you have to transition to remote or hybrid, it's much easier to go that way, um, starting from the remote rather than going from in-person to then now switching to remote. So I pulled this quote up here, measure twice, cut once. And although it's not um, completely parallel to what I, I'm talking about here, but I, the whole idea is that you're planning once and you're planning once for anything. So identifying what it is you want your students to learn and be able to do. Determine how you're going to do this with technology. How are you going to do this remotely using those LMSs that you're using? Are you putting together packets as a combination? Um, of your, your LMS with some packets. What's asynchronous, what's synchronous? So what are you doing in person live, whether you're physically in the classroom or you're on a computer? And what are the things that the students are doing asynchronously, they're doing independently? And so today we're really gonna look at um, some different tips and strategies to help you plan for anything. Second big idea, is to set clear goals and prioritize. We know that this year, it's gonna be very difficult to hit everything that we hit in a typical year. So finding out what is the most important thing to bring into your classroom? What is the most important thing you want your students to learn? And one way to help you identify those priorities is to ask yourself these two questions. Is this relevant? And does this give the biggest gains in achievement? Is it moving the needle? Is it having the greatest impact, the biggest bang for the buck? If the answer is no, then scrap it. So identify those, those priorities. What is gonna be most important for my second grader to, get into, to go into third grade? What's most important for my middle school or high school math student or science ELA student in order to move on to that next level? Identifying those priorities. I really like this analogy, you know, thinking of your classroom as a tiny house. If you have a tiny house, you have to be incredibly um, particular about what you bring into it. It has to have function, but it also needs to look good. So thinking about the content in your classroom as making sure that it does give you the biggest gains, the biggest bang for your buck, and being very, very selective on what you bring into your classroom but also making sure that you're sharing that with your students. You're sharing those goals that, um, with your students uh, in an intentional way. And using those learning targets, using that success criteria is so important. Um, we know important it is for our students when we traditionally in the face-to-face, -face, but when you're in a virtual world, I would argue that's even more important just because they are gonna be on their own. They're gonna be at a computer. They're gonna be at home and if they don't know what it is there to be learning, you know, what learning is going to be done? So making sure that you're able to answer these questions. Do your students know what they need to learn? Do they know why they are learning it, that relevancy piece? Do they, do they know when they have learned it? That's that success criteria. And then providing them the opportunities to reflect on that learning, whether it's through some self-assessment, maybe some formative assessments that you're doing as well, to making sure that they're on their way towards that very clear and focused learning target. Uh, the third consideration, their big idea, and again, with the majority of you already working in this remote setting, is just having those consistent routines. So here's just an example. I had permission from my third graders um, teacher to, to use this. 
but you can see that there's just a consistent time block you know every day monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday you can see that this is a structure that she used when she was virtual but this structure can also be used when you are in person and vice versa. So just making sure you have consistent routines for your students. Now, this is an elementary example, and I know we have you know, quite a few um, secondary teachers on the line too. So thinking about in your classroom, how you set up your, your hour of instruction for your students. You know, Maybe you, you always do some sort of engager at the beginning. You do um, some review or uh, a warm up. Uh, maybe you have them watch a video. Maybe there's collaboration time, and and then they do independent work, and then you have uh, a check-in at the end of class, and they do some sort of formative assessment. So just keeping those those routines consistent is just going to help whether you are in a virtual environment or you have or you're transitioning from an in-person to a virtual or hybrid. Here's just an, another example of just showing you that on a little bit more detail, but I want to thank um, uh, my daughter's teacher, Mrs. McLean, shout out to the third grade teachers at Brown Elementary. But just again, keeping that consistent and using that uh, in the remote setting, using that structure in person as well. It's going to help you stay organized, but it's also going to help your students. The fourth idea is making sure that you have a really a seamless, good structure for organizing your content. So think about what it is that you need to teach for the week and put that into manageable chunks. Um, and then identifying what it is you need to teach, but what are the assets that you need to create? Are there instructional videos that you need to create with this? Are there videos you need to find? Um, working with your grade level team members or working with your content areas, you know, in math, science, English, you know, that teach the same class where you can divide and conquer that work. And making sure that you are always using a consistent structure for your platform. Keep all those materials in one spot and post for each day. So the students know exactly where. Uh, they need to go to find those materials, even if they're at home or when they get to school. Uh, so that's just a great way to make this work for you and for your students. There, uh, in that hyperdoc, in the handout section, I do link to a Google Classroom uh, video that's a great just tips and tricks to help you really manage that content in a way that would work for you and your students. And last. Uh, lastly, I wanted to share with you an idea of thinking long-term. So thinking long-term projects uh, is a great way to gauge your students in a virtual space, but it also is great for transitioning. So let's say that you are in person and you, your students are working on this sustained project. For them now to switch to a virtual or hybrid setting, it's going to be not as difficult because they know that expectation. They've already been working in it. They know that project. They know what it is that they need to do, they know where they need to collaborate. So it's going to be a little bit easier transition for them if they are moving back and forth um, between different learning environments. So project-based learning is an incredible opportunity um, to, to use with your students in any setting. Student ownership is at the heart of PBL, which is great for virtual because they need to be very motivated and they're doing this um, a lot of times asynchronously on their own. It engages the students emotionally, physically, and cognitively. And it's an opportunity to provide an authentic context to integrate multiple standards. So I wanted to share an example with you to show you how this would look like in the classroom but how this could also tr transition into a virtual type of experience. So um, we had some students that went through our, um, these are fourth grade students, for our Prevent the Spread project, where they learn about the spread of germs and they conduct an investigation by swabbing different areas around their classroom of um, unsanitized and sanitized surfaces. And they use different types of um, disinfectants, different soaps, hand sanitizers, that type of thing, to look at their effectiveness. So they're learning about germs, they're running this investigation with the end goal to create a public service announcement to share with an authentic audience, whether it's another class or on social media, about how to prevent the spread of germs. Incredibly relevant um, topic as well. Well, what happens with this class if 
it needs to be moved to a virtual? Well, there's a couple of ways that could be approached. First, um, the, the students probably aren't going to be having petri, petri dishes at home. So the teacher could run this experiment and share the data with them, you know, taking pictures of the bacterial growth and so forth. Or um, you could have the students conduct their own investigation by doing a similar investigation using bread and um, having unwashed hands and then washed hands with different soaps and, and looking at the effect of that as well. So that's a way to, to look at that type of a project and that activity from that project in a, in a virtual setting. As I mentioned, it's a great way to integrate authentic uh, content there. So for this example with the fourth grade students, um, in math, they learned about real life area, which is a fourth grade standard, uh, as they were measuring the bacterial growth on their Petri dishes or on the bread. In ELA, they um, were working on planning, revising, and editing uh, for uh, writing their PSAs. And in social studies, incredibly relevant, they talked about the global impact of a pandemic. So project-based learning is a great authentic way of a sustained type of project um, that will work in any environment. And it's, it's a little bit easier for students to transition between uh, from virtual um, to, to in-person or vice versa. Okay, I'm going to give us our next poll here. So we talked about five big ideas. So which of these do you think is the most challenging? Um, all of them have their challenges, but I'm curious to find out, is it you know, planning for remote? Is it setting clear goals, priorities, you know, what to teach in the classroom? Creating those consistent routines? Organizing your content in that you know, virtual platforms? Or um, thinking those long-term projects? Okay, Robin, how are we looking? So it looks like long well, thinking long-term projects is definitely by far the most challenging at 37%, mm -hmm. followed close or followed by plan for remote first and organized content at 18 and 19%. And then set clear goals is at 14% and uh, create consistent routines is at 12%. Okay, excellent. And so hopefully the strategies I'm gonna share with you next will help um, ease some of those challenges but for the, the long-term projects, I did include in the HyperDoc as well, some resources to look at to get you started you now thinking about maybe those long-term projects, you know, starting small with, with some different ideas or inquiry type of activities that work in any environment. So thank you so much uh, for that. So the next half of our webinar, we're gonna be looking at just those practical tips, those strategies to really make this lesson planning work for you. And the first one I want to share with you is something I like to call the transition day plan. And this really would work anytime where you have a change, whether it is a change from a learning environment going from in-person to virtual or vice versa, uh, or if you need a, a sub plan, you know, this happened um, short notice and you need to pull something together in order for your students to be engaged in meaningful work that's not going to require you to be up till midnight, two or three in the morning to get ready. So uh, the suggestion here and the resource I'm gonna share with you, it's in the HyperDoc as well, link to this, is using flexible schedules. So save yourself and your students that undue stress, make it work for you. Um, so in that example you see on your screen, this is more element, this is an elementary focus type of um, schedule where it's in hour chunks and it can be as open as you want or as specific as you want, all the while by having the students check in with you. And we had created a, a Google form that you could use your students to have them check in, show what they did, uploading a picture um, for each one of these different kind of blocks of time or uh, activities. Another way to think about it, you know, if you teach in a secondary setting, is you know, create a list of those um, activities or websites to go to, videos that you that you know you you really want your students to watch, um, you know, throughout the year, and pull from those and add those to that schedule um, for the students. And maybe you have them, you know, watch the video, do a response 
through a free write where they write down what they've learned and then have them share it with, uh, collaborate with a partner and then share that with you, share that out with you, whether it's a Google Doc, it's a Flipgrid video, something like that to keep them accountable, but also allowing them some choice and flexibility. So consider um, having these transition day plans that can work whenever you have a, a change in your schedule. Here's another example. Again, this is linked in that HyperDoc too, is you know, creating something like a bingo board. And you can have this as open-ended or as structured as, as you like, but also making sure you're, you're holding your students uh, accountable by maybe having them taking a picture of what they did, um, reflecting on it, uh, as well as they, they fill out that bingo board. So transition day plan uh, is a tip to kind of help you get through any time that there is a change in uh, your typical planning. Second resource I wanted to share with you is a lesson planning template. And this is gonna help you take your, your current lessons or your learning targets that you, you've prioritized and kind of go through this guide to really help you turn that into a rich remote experience that's going to work in any environment. So the first thing you're going to do is you're just gonna identify what it is you want your students um, to know or be able to do. And then identify those adjustments that need to be made uh, based upon the virtual world. So here are the questions that you'll answer as you're going through this template. So first, identify that learning target. Then um, answer, how will they meet the target? So what are those learning experiences and activities you want them to do? Thinking about what's the technology I, I need? Do I need to create videos? Do I need to find videos? Um, what adjustments need to be made to my current lesson? Um, next question is, how will I show relevance? So how am I gonna bring relevance in here? Because we know when we add relevance, we're also adding engagement. How will they show that they've met the target? So what's that success look like? And making sure that we're also transparent with that with our students. You know, how will you assess your students? You know, there are some really great tools for formative assessment, uh, tech tools that work um, obviously virtually, but also in the classroom, great checks to see how your students are doing. Uh, so think about those different strategies here, but also think about your summative assessments. In the virtual world, that's tricky. Uh, you know, how are you going to address if you typically do a multiple choice, um, you know, a, a typical test at the end of a unit like that, um, how are you going to adjust for that remote world? Are you going to still do that? And you know, talk about the honor system, maybe you mix up the, the questions, have different forms, maybe you have a, a platform you use that helps you with that. Um, or can you think outside the box a little bit? You know, thinking about those long-term, more sustained projects where there is a product um, as opposed to necessarily a, um, a multiple choice or short answer test that the students can show their learning in that way. And the last two um, areas that you wanna consider as your lesson planning is where are you gonna build in those other opportunities for engagement? Because um, we know in that the virtual space, uh, engagement may look a little different and it's so crucial to keep our kids um, sh showing up, right? We want our kids there, we want them engaged in the content, we want them to still be talking to you, talking to each other. And where can you bring in that collaboration? You know, what are some tools you can use to make sure your students are talking to each other, giving each other feedback, um, you know, sharing, uh, sharing ideas with each other? So that is uh, the lesson planning template, which is also in that, that handout in the HyperDoc that you're welcome to use and share. The third tip um, that I like to just remind uh, everyone is to reach out to your fellow teachers. Uh, this is just a great opportunity. There's been a lot of collaboration uh, because so many, so all of us have had to change how we do things. And, you know, we need support in that. We need support from each other. So look to your colleagues, look to your, um, your other teachers in your district, uh, Twitter, Facebook, you know, regional groups. You know, um, how can we help each other? And in that handy hyperdoc that uh, is in the handouts, put together a list of resources that can help you find what it is that you need. Because you know best what it is you need 
to be able to um, teach in this environment. You know, so uh, webinars such as this, ed camps are a great way to get some professional development, find topics that, that you're interested in that are given by teachers for teachers. Uh, book studies, um, very, you know, that's self-paced, again, of interest to you. One of my favorites, and I just started doing this last year, is Twitter. I didn't realize how much PD you can get from Twitter chats. And so in that resource that I've shared, I've listed some of, um, some of our most recommended you know, Twitter chats and jumping on there. You post a question in Twitter chat, you will definitely get a lot of ideas and answers from teachers from across the country. Um, podcasts and blogs are also great uh, places to reach out um, to, to different teachers and teacher networks. And as you are looking through your lesson plan and your, that lesson planning template we talked about, wanted to intentionally plan for those engagement pieces. You know, how are you going to put engagement into your virtual space? And we know that when we plan lessons, we need to have a hook. So how can you do that virtually? And whatever you do virtually can, can also be used in person in the classroom. So thinking about ways to make it a surprise. So maybe you have your class meeting as part of your routine and you have a mystery guest, like uh, you have the principal. Um, join in, or you have an industry expert that comes to talk to your students about, um, you know, geology, whatever it happens to be. You send your students on a mystery virtual field trip. You do, you conduct a daring demonstration or a song, um, you, you know, live, or maybe you record it, um, and maybe you change locations. So maybe you're teaching, if you're teaching virtually and you're you're going into school every day, maybe you you go to the library and uh, conduct your class. Maybe you go to the principal's office, the school office, the gym, the cafeteria, whatever it happens to be. Or if you're at home, change locations in your home. Um, that's a great way to just up that surprise or mystery factor. Thinking about uh, bringing games in, uh, in the handy hyperdoc included some games such as virtual categories, flippity. So those games that you would play in your classroom, you can also play a lot of those virtually with your students. And again, this is just upping that engagement. Uh, attention factor is bringing in props, dressing in character, wearing different hats for different things, and just you know connecting to the content as you're doing that as well. So just some considerations for engagement. In the lesson planning template, also talked about how to consider for collaboration opportunities. Because even if you're in person, if your students have to be socially distant, um, it's not as if they're going to be able to be right next to each other and collaborating. So these tools work in classroom or virtual. Um, one that uh, I was just brought was just brought to my attention. I'm really excited about is Cami. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's an interactive markup tool, and it's compatible with Google Classroom, Schoology, and Canvas. And it's got a really a lot of cool features. You can manipulate. The text you can add, you can do speech to text, um, so it's really helpful. And but it can help let you manipulate a PDF or static document. Um, so you can go in and make edits. You have your students annotate. So it's a great way for students to collaborate. Another great collaboration tool is Padlet. Um, it's a virtual bulletin board. Students can share ideas, give feedback to each other. Jamboard and Whiteboard dot chat. Those are both virtual whiteboards. They're interactive. Again, students can share ideas, uh, collaborate on different uh, projects. A Jamboard is a Google extension. Um, whiteboard.chat, you would just go to whiteboard.chat. And lastly, just thinking about those breakout rooms in your virtual spaces. You know, in, in Zoom, you can do those quite easily. In Google Meet, a little bit more manual process, but there is a video I linked in the HyperDoc that shows you how to do that. And then next month we have a um, a webinar that's solely uh, uh, on collaboration and different strategies for you. So check that out too if you're interested in finding out more about that. And lastly, thinking about those formative assessment ideas that you can bring in, those low tech ideas that work well in any environment. You know, fist to five, uh, using colors, using letters. String of confidence, something I put in the hyperdoc too. You can have the students identify where they're at on this confidence line. Thinking about um, exit tickets, they can do this very quickly, like in a Google form or a Google slide. Uh, and then we have, there's a ton of tech tools out there. Here are 
for these ones that I my favorite to use um, Google Forms, Kahoot, Quizlet, or Socrative, just a really quick quick checks to see where the students are in their learning. So Robin, we'll just do our last uh, poll here. Um, so which of these tips or ideas are you most excited to try? Um, that transition day plan, uh, looking at that lesson planning template to help you plan for your lessons, uh, reaching out to teacher networks, uh, those strategies, different strategies we talked about for engagement, and then the strategies we talked about for collaboration and assessment. So it looks like everyone's going to use a little bit of everything, but the highest comes in at 48% for strategies for engagement followed by strategies for collaboration and assessment at 34%, then transition day plan, 18%, lesson planning template at 13%, and teacher networks at 7%. Okay, excellent. Well, and just to remind you, we have a, uh, our next webinar next month is on solely collaboration. And then we are going to be planning an assessment webinar, I believe in a couple months after that too. So please stay tuned. Uh, as well. And if you like what you heard, please um, share this with your administrator. We'd love to come to your school in person or uh, virtually. And we can, um, whatever it is that you're needing, uh, if you don't see it on the list of the different uh, offerings we have, we can definitely work with you and, um, you know, make this work for you, for your school and your school and your personal goals. Here's just a reminder about the webinar next month. I will be sending out a, a follow-up email after this so you can have, uh, you'll have all that information to sign up as well. Hope to, to see you all there. And lastly, I just want to thank you for everything you do every single day for your students, for your school, and for your community. And uh, I'd love to give away one free Blue Apple project. I talked about Prevent the Spread uh, earlier in the webinar, and there are nine other projects that you could pick from. Uh, so, in order to be entered, if you would please send me your um, favorite time-saving lesson planning tip, you know, something that you've used, um, send that to me and you'll be entered to win uh, a free project. So, my email's there, it's dawn.mccatter at vaei.org, and if you could send that to me by tomorrow, I will draw a winner on Friday. So, thank you again very much. Uh, thank you for spending the time. Um, with us this evening, and I hope you have a wonderful, joyful, and incredibly restful holiday season. You all deserve it. Thanks so much, and have a great night. Bye, everyone.